there were debates in the 19th century among the bishops. Uh, it kind of broke down Irish Catholic were pro-America, um, German American bishops, at least some of the most vociferous that were anti-Americanist were German American in background. Um, and eventually it, it percolates up to the Vatican. Um, and one of the things that I, I didn't really fathom until I wrote this book and, and did more reading in, in Roman Catholic history was, you know, from the Vatican's perspective, there, so much of their political history was tied up in European politics, European geopolitics, getting the Austrians to bail us out now, getting the French to get out of here now, making alliances with Spain, all these different Roman Catholic powers, the papacy needed to maneuver in that universe. So from that perspective in the 19th century and even 18th, you're looking at America and you're saying, what? It's a colonial society. It's largely British. It's Protestant. Why do we care? Right. And sure, we'll try to help out whatever Roman Catholics are there, but there aren't many. There are only 30,000 out of 3 million at the, in 1790, the first census, I think. So it's not a big player, but in the Cold War era and with the United States emerging as this major pl player in the free world, yeah. Europe, Europe is really in disarray. Anti-communism, right? Right. And, and, and the, the Vatican is anti-communist. Um, it's not anti-communist in the same way that Americans are necessarily, but still – at that point, the Vatican has to take America much more seriously. If you're going to do business in global politics, you got to come come to terms with America. So that's another reason. That's not in any way. I'm not suggesting that that's kind of the background for what happens at Vatican II and the bishops recognizing religious freedom there. But it's more just in, in the, the sense that the American church becomes a much bigger player after World War II, because now they are the ones who are in this major power. And if the bishop, if, if the Pope and the Vatican officials are going to get any kind of insight into America, they're going to need, need to deal with the, with the American bishops as well. Right. So, and this is, you know, obviously this becomes true as well when it comes to wealth and, and the capacity that American Catholics have to give money for church causes, whether in the United States or elsewhere. So you just see this this enormous shift. But back to the um, problem with Americanism, it seemed to go against the idea, especially what's crucial in Murray's formulation of of the of the issue, the idea that error has no rights. Mm -hmm. This was a position that Protestants also had whenever wherever you have a, a religious establishment, the Puritans were not interested in giving rights to Quakers or Baptists, for instance. That's why Roger Williams had to leave. That's why Anne Hutchinson had to leave the colony. So the idea that your true freedom is to do the right thing, is the freedom to do the right thing. And if you use freedom to do the wrong thing, to believe the wrong thing, to, to commit sin, well, then we can't give freedom for that. And it's a, it's an understandable position. It's a, it's a position that a lot of Protestants would largely agree with, even though the error and the correct positions would be different for Protestants and Roman Catholics. But it takes until the 1960s for Rome finally to embrace or to get around the idea that error actually can have rights, that we can have freedom for wrong religious views, even freedom for less than perfect marriage arrangements, etc. Not to say that the, that the church is recognizing Protestant marriages or something, but but still in those societies where there are Roman Catholics, you know, we can recognize the validity of those marriages, et cetera, et cetera. So it goes across the board like that, but it does take, you know, it takes Rome until the 1960s, whereas for Protestants, for instance, at the time of the, of the American founding, they've come around to it by then. But even before that, um, at different iterations in British history, in the 18th century, you can see gradual recognition of more rights for Christians who are outside the church. And in England, say, for instance, with the ending of the Test Act for Catholics, 
1829 or 28, somewhere in there, Roman Catholics finally have the right to vote. If they qualify on the other grounds of property and whatnot, they can run for office, they can go to university, etc. So it it's not until the 19th century, say, that the English church catches up with this. But it, again, it's another 140 years for the Roman Catholic church to overcome this basic idea that Yes, we can grant rights for people to commit error. Sure. But was there also suspicion from the Vatican that <laughs> Americanism was bound up with or maybe even the product of modernism? I mean, there seemed to be right. suspicion of American of the American politics or the American experiment for two reasons. Either it's too religiously Protestant <laughs> or it's not religious at all and it's like bound up with the French Revolution. And just is utterly, you know, vacuous void <laughs> of, right. of any righteousness whatsoever. And so it's interesting to me to see the intersection of this in, in 1910, for example, with the anti-modernist oath, which was issued, right. if I get my popes correct, by Leo XIII. And, um, it's a Pope Pius X, the Pius X, the X but then maybe, yeah. maybe later Leo had some other involvement later on. But then in, in 1917, there was a... There was a code of canon law or something that was issued where right. where there was a, a prohibition um, or at least a, a requirement that uh, the theology of Thomas Aquinas and et cetera would be taught um, in all the Catholic institutions and whatnot. So there's great suspicion about modernism and uh, the employment of uh, the philosophy of Thomas Aquinas to answer that problem. And so to look at uh, American ideals and whatnot, and if they are seen as a product of modernism, uh, that could add just almost insuperable, uh, you know, obstacles to any, to any, uh, I guess, approval of uh, Roman Catholic hierarchy of Catholics being involved in this type of a government. Right. And, and so it's, it's curious in a good way that you bring up the French Revolution, which again, through the lens of European politics in the 18th and 19th centuries, the Vatican, I mean, is, is literally assaulted by the French with Napoleon, say, invading Italy in the 1790s. Um, <clears throat> but that's one way of saying, again, that the Vatican's perspective on the world is through European affairs. So here you have a French, the French embracing republicanism, and you have a Americans embracing republicanism. Well, it must be the same, but but I would argue they are different. The, um, the French philosophical background, such as I know it, is is different from the from the British one to which the founders appealed. Um, but it's also if you throw into the mix there and kind of you can maybe Protestants may be able to, and Reformed Protestants in particular may be able to sympathize with this. But with, when you think about the anti revolutionary party that Kuiper founds in the late 19th century in the Netherlands. He also saw the revolution in very black and white categories. So that's why he wanted to be an anti-revolutionary party. But he also said really, really good things about the American revolution and the American system of government. So, you know, when you, you brought up modernism then with the condemnation in 1907, I think was the encyclical 1910 was the oath. Yeah. Um, and, and at that point, the Vatican does lump Americanism in with modernism, even though modernism is more a philosophical tradition. And um, but they do somehow work the political philosophy behind Americanism into that notion. But it isn't, again, instructive for those of uh, in our circles of the OPC when Machen's writing against modernism, say, in, you know, in the 20s, obviously, um, there, there are good reasons to be concerned about modernism and these philosophical developments. Yeah. And so, again, there's not as much, you know, there's a real difference about what the correct stuff is, but there's also a similarity in some ways of viewing what the threats are, whether it's the French Revolution, whether it's certain philosophical developments. So Protestants are also anti-modernist um, the way Machen was, even though he's politically He's much more on board with the American founding sure. than Rome would be at that point. 